Hi, everyone, and welcome. The description of unprecedented and uncertain times seems wanting, especially now, but clearly leaders and their employees are searching for the appropriate way to steer through these uncharted waters. And there are few people more experienced and qualified than our guest, Tom Peters, to provide strong and tested advice on best business practices. I'm Jim Falk, president of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. And today's conversation is uh, sponsored by the law firm Greenberg Trowig. GT means go to. So Tom Peters, he's a native of Baltimore. And I have to say, having grown up in Virginia, I wasn't surprised when he said that he had a lacrosse stick in one hand and oars in the other. Armed with an engineering degree from Cornell, Tom uh, served in the United States Navy where he was a CB. And he had actually two deployments to Vietnam. Uh, then he moved to the Nixon White House, where he was a special advisor on drug abuse. Uh, and from there, he earned his uh, MBA and PhD in organizational behavior uh, at the same time, uh, from Stanford at the same time that he was working with McKinsey and Company. And he used that time as a period to uh, really be the launch pad for the stage of his career that, that we know so well. In 1982, he and his co-author, Bob Waterman, published the classic, In Search of Excellence. And yeah, it was a century ago, but NPR in 1999 named In Search of Excellence as one of the top three books of the 20th century. And from there, the Peters brand took off. As the CEO of Floyd Consulting said, I'd rather hire someone who has studied Peters' writings than someone who has an MBA, perhaps even from Stanford. So I also want to add, I encourage all of you to take the time to go to tompeters.com, where you'll find, free of charge, essentially a lot of Tom's written material. Great to see you again, Tom. I guess it's been about a year and a half since you were in Dallas. Yeah, the, uh, the last book was 2018, and I came down and saw you guys and my pal Carl Sewell uh, shortly thereafter. So let's begin uh, with this, because today is Juneteenth Day, a uh, celebration that really commemorates uh, when slaves in the state of Texas realized that they were free. It, it took two years for it to get to Texas, but it does have special significance here and especially now around the United States. And you and I have both lived through the civil rights movement, uh, the protest in the, in the 60s. When you look back, and you consider that, and now you look at BLM, Black Lives Matter, um, do you think this truly is a, a turning point, a lasting turning point for how our nation's wounds will be healed? I think it's a lasting realization point. And it's too early to say whether or not it'll be a turning point. The thing that was fascinating to me, and I hope you'll respond because it's a fresh thought that I had, First of all, I, you know, at first when this happened, I said to people, said, this is the most incredible thing in the world. I said, I was in Washington, D.C. for the King riot, so don't give me that. But it seems to me that it's two separate pieces. We fixed a lot of describable problems during the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. But in retrospect, we didn't touch this deep-grained inequality which has now come to the very top of the list, and which does not in any way reduce the importance of, uh, you know, of what happened in round one. But this, I won't say this was a bigger deal. It's, it's cellular deep, molecular deep. And, you know, the, I, I was about to say something that's totally inappropriate. Um, we're not gonna fix it overnight, and so we are gonna to continue to have things such as inappropriate shootings. So it's not like if we can only get through the first one, everything will be okay. I'm sorry to say it's gonna keep on happening as we've seen in the last two or three weeks. Uh, but I think it's an enormous deal. You know, I've spent a lot of the last 25 years on women's issues uh, and, and in uh, about a month from now, two months from now, we will have the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. I mean, one of the things that's fascinating about that to me, and I am 100 years old, is to think that it was so recent that we gave women the vote. But no, I think it's a huge deal uh, from 
my perspective, which may be a little self-serving, the things, as you well know, that I care about, I believe are more important than ever. And maybe my, to summarize it in two words, my people first message will take on, between COVID-19 and this, will take on a different coloring. I mean, with the COVID-19 thing, uh, and it was, you know, I'm not gonna write the book, but it was a business book writer's dream. There were people who responded extraordinarily well, and there were people who responded horribly. And, uh, you know, if you ever want in search of excellence and in search of crap, you, you know, you, yeah. <laughs> you've got two halves, halves to the book. I think in a few minutes, I want to get to some of those companies and leaders. And even though you might be 100 years old, I think you still have time to write that book. And I hope you, <laughs> I hope you will. You know, you raise a good point, though, because when you look at what happened in the 60s and 70s and beyond, it really was legal. And now what you're seeing is so many people really looking within themselves and changing the culture. And I may be wrong about this, um, and I hope I'm not getting ahead of my skis, but it seems to me that in the LGBTQ community, some of the cultural issues changed before the legal. And here, what you're seeing is legal before culture. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'll be the, I will be the moderator and you be the guest. I think that, I think that's, no, I think that's an absolutely brilliant analysis. I mean, I happened to, by sheer coincidence, I went to work for McKinsey and Company in San Francisco in 1974, and that's just when the gay coming out party was going on, and the epicenter of it was indeed San Francisco. But it absolutely speaks to, you know, to what you were saying. It was the moral, emotional thing then, and the legislation and so on caught up later. So your parents, as did mine, talked about the Great Depression. In a sense, they talked about that more than they talked about World War II, and in hindsight, that surprises me. But how do you think um, our children and our grandchildren will remember this period of, of, of you know, really two significant issues, COVID-19 and the uh, BLM? Well, we will get down on bended knee uh, open the Bible and pray that they will see it as a landmark which really made huge cultural differences. Uh, I mean, the obvious, honest answer is we haven't got a clue. Uh, you know, and, and people have been saying, relative to the racial thing, is it's damn near genetically driven and really erasing true biases. Uh, is not going to happen overnight. And it just, you, you don't want problems, more problems to arise, but you really don't want this thing. I think it's a golden opportunity. And, you know, the other part of it, and I really hadn't thought about it this way, is when the iPhone generation, who don't actually know they're living human beings with things like skin, when the iPhone generation grows up, maybe meaning teenage and certainly meaning by college time, maybe they're going to look at the whole social interaction thing in a way that you and I can't even conceive. And that may be a good thing. We may, you know, read the, we're redefining, I mean, for God's sakes, with, you know, work from home and with Zoom and with the iPhone generation and kids sleeping with their 70% of kids sleep or women girls sleep with their iPhone under their pillow, for God's sakes. Uh, well, there's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's deep. That's deep social change. That is called, and, and I, I mean, on the other hand, I always worry about that. The great management guru, Henry, Kiss, uh, Henry Kissinger. No, I don't think so. <laughs> Henry Mintzberg uh, once said, it is the conceit of every generation to think that they are handling the world's most god-awful mess and things were easy in the old days. And what I think, again, given my age, is I, I, the, the first part, I, I wish I could, you know, I wish we had two hours because I would read the page out of my book. I think it was Henry who triggered it. I wrote a page in my book about what my mother had gone through. And she was born in 1909 and she died in 2005. 
And it was everything from long distance phone calls to movies and then, you know, a man on the moon, you know, by the end of her life and, and so on. And at one level, I, as I wrote the thing, I kind of started laughing hysterically because it, it made, you know, what was going on around me look a lot less significant. Well, I think I'm going to really uh, sort of light you up with this question. <laughs> Let's talk about the way the government, particularly Washington, whether it's, well, not just limited to Washington, because we're seeing it in Texas with the governor's office, how government is handling the COVID-19, because you preach transparency. And we're certainly not really seeing that with COVID-19 from our elected officials at the highest level down to at least state level in many cases? Well, one thing I feel very strongly about, and I cannot say I memorized the Constitution, is with the COVID-19 thing, we are being blessed by the founding fathers having left a hell of a lot of power at the states. Uh, because God knows we have not gotten the leadership uh, in any way, shape, or form. We've gotten leadership, but it's been 180 degrees in the wrong direction. And we've had 50 governors. And again, there have been pluses and there have been minuses. But I think a lot of them, and everybody uses Cuomo, and I'm not following New York that closely, a lot of governors have stepped up to the plate. Uh, and a lot of them, of course, like Michigan's governor, have gotten you know, whacked over the head with AK-47 stocks um, as a result thereof. But I, I think, I, I know how bad it is, but I bet you, if you and I knew in detail a lot more than we do, that I want to say significant majority, but a majority of the governors, you would give them passing or more than passing grades. And, and, we, and we don't think about states' rights on a you know, day to day to day basis, partially because the media is totally focused on what happens in metropolitan Washington. But I think a lot of governors have stepped up. Uh, I think the criminal thing, and we see it, I wore my mask today, just a small point. And I mean, for God's sakes, when you can politicize mask wearing, and maybe against old age, you've got to shake your head. Yeah. I mean, should I wear it? Should I? I mean, my whole point, and I got nasty about this in Twitter, and uh, you know, supposedly, supposedly you were a non-mask wearer, and my response was, I don't give two hoots in hell about you, and I'm sorry to say I don't give two hoots in hell about your family. What I do give two hoots in hell about is you poisoning people who are randomly selected on the street who have nothing to do with you. It's, it's your power to screw them up that pisses me off, not your decision as to whether you want to get the damn thing early or not. So I'm holding here a, a printout, um, and it's called Excellence 2020, the 27 number ones, and we won't have time to go through all of them. But one of the things that you have talked about for a very long time is put women in positions of responsibility. And we have seen a number of articles from The Economist and New York Times about how certain women leaders around the world, whether it's New Zealand or Germany, have done perhaps a more effective job in helping their countries get through COVID-19 than uh, others. Why do you think this is the case? Well, I think you have to be incredibly careful about generalizations. I obviously agree with what you say, said. My short form answer is that from everything down to the genes, women are more thoughtful about human interaction than men are. And, and, I, and I just have to say this because I don't want to piss a lot of people off. Gender traits are distributed on a bell-shaped curve. In general, women are much better listeners than you and I are. But obviously, there are men who are good listeners and women who are bad listeners. So I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to get convicted on that trap. But I mean, here there was a. I, I read a book called *The Female Brain*, written by a woman called Luann Brizendeen, who is an M.D., Ph.D. neuropsych person from the University of California, San Francisco, and, and 
There are a million little stories, but the one that really hit me between the eyes, which is a funny term to have used, by the age of three days after birth, baby girls are making five times more eye contact than you and I are. And, and to me, I don't know how the people who are listening to us or watching us are going to interpret that, but to me, that says this paying attention to the, the problems and so on on a one-to-one -one basis of people is a, a, a lot more of a female thing than a male thing. And the, and the other thing about, you know, the photos that you showed, which I think is really terrific, is, uh, you know, dear Jacinda in New Zealand is one thing, but Mrs. Merkel is a tough cookie, you know, PhD in some unpronounceable uh, subset of chemistry and so on. But I, I, you know, my remark when something happened in the news a couple of weeks ago, which is a continuation of what you asked, is I said, I want to go to Congress and I want to see a law passed that does not allow a male to be the CEO of a hospital. And, uh, you know, it's obviously a stupid statement, which it was meant to be, but it's the same issue. Uh, you know, and the hospitals are getting whacked, you know. People are sick, but they won't go to the hospital and the finance. Well, I mean, that's a different story because the, the conglomeratization of hospitals is very troublesome to say the least. Well, let's stay on the hospitals for a minute because we are seeing um, Baylor Hospital here, I'm forgetting the full name, Baylor's Wynn or Scott, or excuse me, but you know, essentially Baylor Hospital laid off thousands of people. And just for the reason that you said, um, people aren't, aren't going to the hospital, they're not getting elected surgery. And I've, I've, I've heard you recently speak about how important it is for companies during this period to really bite the bullet and keep their people employed, uh, reduce CEO salaries, and realize that we're in this for a certain period of time. And so my question to you is now, I buy that completely last February and March. Now it seems a more difficult argument because we are in nearly July um, and you know we are not out of the woods. I don't think we're out of the first wave. So how does a, a large company like Baylor Scott and um, White look at this versus maybe a, a a smaller company? Well, and, and I I don't want to get too badly slapped in the face for this. Let's talk about it in two different ways. One of them is the practical answer to your question. And one of them is the higher level thing of how the leadership team behaves. Uh, you know, I believe, which doesn't solve the problem of nobody getting elective surgery, but I believe that a significant share of this story is the intensity of the visible caring and concern for their fellow human beings that is exhibited by senior management, whether it's Macy's or whether it's Baylor or whether it's um, Mass General, which is our big hospital here, and its conglomerate had to cut wages for 50,000 people just a couple days ago. Uh, I think you can do things well and do things less well. Uh, I think you can, and again, I just always worry about political loading. I think you can behave as if you had a union, even if you don't have a union, meaning both sides are equally engaged. Uh, I, agree, I agree with your fundamental premise that it's different now than it was three months ago when we were in a this too will pass mode. Uh, and we can't talk about government bailouts because that's not your question. That will either happen or it won't happen. I think you, if we're talking about Baylor or Mass General, and you've asked the question differently, so I, it's not one where I feel like I have some you know, pat answer. I think I would really work hard to keep people's benefits, even if I had to give them a hit in the chops uh, relative to salary itself. 
you know, I would, I would, I would, I would die if I didn't think the, in uh, Mass General's case, I would die if I didn't think the 50,000 people who worked for me were not able to continue on a significant basis relative to health care. Uh, whether it's Baylor or whether it's the Ford Motor Company, Ford division of the Ford Motor Company. Uh, it, it's base human concerns. Uh, I mean, you know, the economists are saying it's going to take us what it took five, six, seven years to work out of the two, 2008 thing. And this thing could go on for a decade or two. Uh, because, you know, the other part of it, and this is not your question. Uh, is you can it turn it away out, from my question, Tom. <laughs> no, no, it turns out that this damn thing is, is happening at exactly the time that IT and artificial intelligence are going through the roof and the acceleration of the use of AI is just insane. And there were a couple of Oxford economists who became famous and there are some questions uh, about three years ago. And they said that artificial intelligence will dramatically to the point of unemployment affect 50% of white collar jobs in the United States over a 20 year period. And so there was also already an insane amount of yogurt that was hitting the fan. And you know, one, once everybody gets used to WFH, the, it's entirely possible, and I've talked to some buddies who are real estate developers, that the towers of Houston, Detroit, Boston, et cetera, are gonna be half empty. Uh, you know, the, the other thing, I, so let me ask you I that. had some real blowback on this on Twitter. Uh, if you know any four-star generals, uh, I wanna see a Thunderbirds flyover specifically dedicated to the housekeepers and lower level employees in hospitals. Uh, and I realize it's money that could be spent somewhere else, but the reality is the Thunderbirds and the Blue Angels are not gonna lose their budget. I, I, it, it, it's, it, it's, you just have to be so damn careful. Uh, saying thank you doesn't, doesn't equate to money in the pocket. God, do people raise, rise to thoughtfulness. You know, you said, I don't think you said it on the air, maybe you did, but you did say it on the air. Uh, you were a Virginian. I'm a Southern Marylander whose mother was a Virginian. And I have said to many people, I am sure my mother did very well on fundamental love, but the number one thing she gave me for all the problems we see in the South at times was Southern courourtesy. <laughs> and you're know, behaving decently toward others. What you talk about is be kind. Away. You always say be kind. And I, I, I loved where you wrote about how when you are hiring someone from not your human resources division, but your people division, you want to hire people who are kind. And talk a little bit about how you don't always want to hire the A performer, that sometimes it's better to have a different group, a different context. Absolutely. That's, uh, as you know, you're setting me up because you know it's a favorite question right now. Uh, <laughs> one, one of the people who was quoted in my last book runs Optinos, which is a pretty big deal. Peter Miller is his name, pretty big deal biotech company. Uh, and he said, we only hire nice people. And here's the important catch that our listeners, viewers should, should listen to. He said, okay, I need somebody for a technical job. And it is a degree that you, Tom Peters, can't even pronounce the name of, which is associated with biochemistry or what have you. He said, let me tell you a secret that I found out. There are actually a lot of people in the world that have that degree. Don't hire the jerks. And it's not because, oh my God, I need a Stanford, I need a uh, you know, computer science thing. So that's number one. Nice people are around. And God, is he serious. You're the guy with the degree. I interview you. I'm the CEO. I fall desperately in love with you and want to hand you the contract while we're talking. But his rule, and he uses the term, I know it's not a new term, after you finish talking to me, you've got to run the gauntlet. And that's 15 interviews. And it's interviews with receptionists. It's interviews with junior accountants in the finance department. 
And any one of those 15 has veto power over your hiring. Uh, and it's, and, and you know, I, I think that's just, the, the, as you know, I'm, I'm rabid on this topic. Well, the other one that you said, uh, there was a fantastic Google study that Google did two topics. Number one is characteristics of best employees. They identified eight characteristics and seven of them were the so-called soft stuff, like listening, appreciating people with cultural backgrounds that were different and so on. Uh, and then they did, which is the one that in a way our listeners and viewers want to hear more, uh, is they assessed the most innovative Google teams. And remember, this is Google where 275 is considered a low IQ. Uh, and Google does something which I think is a disgrace. People are ranked as A players or B players. A, I think it's a disgrace to humanity. And I, a, B, I think it's stupid because there's no, never been a better way to you know, demotivate 50% of the population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yes, yes. Uh, but the B player teams, same story, were much more successful than the A player teams. And it was the same damn list. They did a list of the attributes, and it was listening, it was respect. One of them, when we think about the Googles and the Facebooks and so on, is, and I loved it because it actually came in first or second on the list, no intellectual bullying. And I'm sure you and I have both been around some 275 IQ people, and their level of self-certainty goes through, and, and even though your IQ is only 274, and what a schmuck. You know, I don't even talk to people like you, but I love, I love the Google thing. And so I, I'm arguing A, and the second part is the <clears throat> pragmatic one for people who are listening to us with, you know, at least middle-sized companies. A, hire for EQ, hire nice people, hire empathetic people. But B, and this is actually more important to somebody who has a company of 25 or more people. EQ is first, second, third, and fourth for every promotion decision. Hmm. The most, you know, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the research evaluations here are all over the map. Uh, 50 to 75 people, 75% 75 of people all over the world are not engaged with their jobs. Uh, and I don't care whether it's Mauritius, I don't care in the United States whether it's Mississippi or Massachusetts, the number one reason people are not engaged is the quality of their first line manager. And then you've got these stats which say the effectiveness of the first line manager is the number one variable that it contributes to productivity, to innovativeness, to, to retention, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope you'll listen to me relative to EQ and hiring, and I damn well order you to listen to me relative to EQ and the promotion of people into management positions. You know, I have never liked the phrase soft skills. It's just like in international politics, we talk about Joseph Nye's soft power versus hard power. And as someone who happens to have- Are you world experience. affairs councils, guys? Ah, the people you cite, I love it. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, the skills that you learn by majoring in English, foreign languages, anthropology, they're important. And you've actually shown that us liberal arts majors who might not make very, I mean, heck, my first job, I think I was making $12,000. But uh, in, in the end, you're, you've found that liberal arts majors actually do better. Well, there are two things. And uh, if we were speaking longer, I'd get up and walk across the room. Uh, thing number one, and interestingly enough, it goes back to Mr. Mintzberg, our Canadian guru. Uh, he did research that said exactly what you said, except it's got hard numbers. Uh, when your kind of people, English majors, graduate, you get one half as many job offers at one half the starting salary as my kind of people who were the civil engineers. Then we track it at year 20. You are kicking us in the butt. The liberal arts people have shot past the engineers and the MBAs and so on 
and there was something which said, and in fact, some big financial services company did a, did a study, 75% of the worst of their worst managers were, you know, MBAs, engineers, and so on. And, you know, that makes, that makes perfect. And there's been just a, you know, you can sit there and click a button and look it up on Amazon or Google or what have you. There has been a, uh, a spate of books in the last eight months published on why the liberal arts degree is more important than ever. Uh, and it always has been one of them. The one title I remember because it was such a good title is called the Fuzzies, F-U-Z-Z-I-E-S, the Fuzzies and the Techies, why the Fuzzies will rule Silicon Valley. Uh, and, you know, I just want to divert with that because it was actually something I was thinking about and wrote a little bit about yesterday. Uh, I read, and it makes sense, that AI within five to 10 years will have no trouble doing the work that is done by a junior Google engineer with a 4.0 average from Stanford or MIT. Uh, that, that is wipe outable uh, by artificial intelligence. The jobs that won't be wiped out will be the ones that require human interaction. I, I, I've got this term, which you can like or dislike, and I call it extreme humanization. The way companies will succeed is being by is be you will use the technology, but by being more human than you have ever been before, creating experiences with emotional attachments that are more significant than before. And so it's you know I, I what I wrote in this the uh, you know the only thing left for us is us. Uh, it's the it's the people stuff which is going to drive things more. And I don't think I'm being a soft-headed old fart when I say that. Let me, um, we have, uh, I don't know the person's name. It just has a number, but uh, let me read this comment to you. My father, who was born in 1919, used to tell me, always hire C students. A students are the researchers of the world. B students become doctors and lawyers, and C students run the companies. They are the most diversified and care about people. My dad owned an employment agency. Um, <laughs> Listen, you've got to you've got to have that guy who sent the comment. You've got to have him as a guest. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, Peter Jaselia, and and Peter, I know you uh, watch a lot of our webinars, and I'm going to ask you: Would you put in the chat box or send me how to pronounce your last name phonetically? Because I'm sure I've butchered it. But Peter has this question: um, Putting people first was the reason 20 years ago I gave you info about a 1979 bill in Congress that proposed to challenge all youth between 17 to 18 to engage um, in, in talks on civic values, civic education, and volunteer service. I, I will say, Tom Peters, we've had so many guests who have said, st stood up at our podium and said, we need a volunteer service core. What are your thoughts on this? And Peter, again, thanks for your questions. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, I. I, I really, really believe it's the case. And, and I don't think this is a stretch. Uh, some people have said that in ye olde days, you went into the army. And the army, and I remember General Powell said this, he came off the streets and went into the army. Uh, the army is more about teaching human relations than it is about teaching how to use a shoulder-launched missile thingy. Uh, and we don't have that anymore, and we don't have the draft anymore, and, and whether that's good or bad is not relevant to me. Uh, but social service, I think, is a must. And I, yeah, have you ever, and maybe their requirements had to be different, have you ever met somebody who came back from the Peace Corps who is now 65, whose entire life was not altered by that experience of working in Nigeria or wherever it is. I've never met anybody who that was the case. And I got to tell you one, one other little example, and I'll make it fast that somebody sent me. It's a little bit like your questions. There was a home services group out of the University of Pennsylvania in, uh, uh, in Philadelphia, and the group had a, an annual turnover number of 77%. They did a lot of research because they're researchers uh, and they changed the employment criteria 
and started looking for the soft stuff and downgrading C, C grades, downgrading the degree stuff. And at least 30% of the people who are, are watching us are not going to believe what I'm going to say. Their turnover went from 77% to 1.7%. And the hospitalizations of the people who they were serving went down by 40%. And they would have these, you know, part of the hiring process, they would have these socials. And the question is, you're applying for a job. You know, I'm talking to you. Do you listen or do you have to shoot back and, and, and exhibit to me your brilliance? And they were looking for listening. They were looking for social service in the person's background. But good God, 77% to 1.7%. And, you know, these were hard-nosed. University of Pennsylvania, health services researchers. I mean, every one of them knows more statistics than you and I do by a factor of 10. No doubt. Here's a question from Ray Termini. Who comes first in a business, the employee or the customer? And who is more important to the business, the customer or the shareholder? And we've certainly seen a lot of discussion about that. And it seems that COVID-19 has accelerated that the, 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 the importance of the discussion. Yeah, first of all, and I know this sounds silly, that's the easiest question known to humankind. Uh, consider this. In 1970, Milton Friedman wrote his seminal Maximize Shareholder Value paper, and it got picked up. In 1970, 50% of corporate profits went to the workers and to investment in things like R&D. We are now 50 years on. 50 years later, the 50% that went to R&D and workers is now down to 9%, and the other 91% goes to stoking the ever so dangerous inequality that exists in the United States. My old pals at McKinsey did a study of relative to this of long-term performance of big publicly traded companies. And the ones who invested for the long term destroyed the ones who were investing for the next 90 days. And this is over data with over a 40 year period or something like that. The shareholder value maximization thing I called Dante on the phone the other day and I said, invent an extra ring of hell for the CEOs who have bought into maximizing shareholder value and make sure it's hot. Uh, the first half of the question I think is equally easy. My old pal, Hal Rosenbluth, ran a company called Rosenbluth International as a travel services company. Uh, miraculous, all of its performance eventually sold to Amex, uh, but he wrote a book in the name of his book, uh, I'm not going to get it exactly, was called Putting the Customer Second. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I believe that the way I say it in my seminars, if you want to put the customer first, then you have to put the employee more first. Somebody, a healthcare CEO did the same kind of study. Uh, and my, my favorite is a guy who's a, a customer service uh, guru, runs a chain of, of salon businesses. And his one-liner, which every, every one of us can remember, your customers will never be any happier than your employees. And I don't think that's a throwaway line. So to me, it's a no-brainer. Uh, you know, if, if, the, if, if the employee is being treated well, that'll rub off sometimes directly and all the time indirectly on the service or whatever that she or he gives. I mean, that, honest to God, I'm not trying to insult the questioner, obviously. Both of the answers to those questions define the term no-brainer. We have about another 10 minutes. This has gone by so quickly. And I'd like to ask you about, uh, because I think we promised our viewers we would talk about what's the best way to communicate during COVID-19. We've touched on some of that. 
but you pulled, uh, and I, uh, you've either memorized it or I hope you have it around, the six points uh, that were sent out by the Blue Mountain Community College uh, to their employees. And I had to look up where Blue Mountain Community College was, but it's in uh, God's country in Oregon, I guess. But uh, do you have those in front of you or could I read them and ask you to react? Funny thing. You have them. I won't really say I prepared for this, but <laughs> I had them right in front of me. Take uh, it away. <laughs> the town name is uh, Boardman, Oregon. Uh, Blue Mountain Community College, Boardman, Oregon. Uh, when they sent people home, they sent a memo. And I almost tear up. And by the way, ask me about tear up because I want to say something. Six points. Number one, you are not quote unquote, working for home, unquote. You are, quote, at your home during a crisis trying to work, unquote. Two, your personal physical, mental, and emotional health is extremely important right now. Take care of yourself. Oh my God, that's a big one. Three, you should not try to compensate for lost productivity by working longer hours. Four, be kind to yourself and don't judge how you are coping based on how you see others coping. Five, be kind to others and don't judge others in how they are coping based on how you are coping. And number six, success will not be measured the same way it was when things are normal. I mean, I think it's just beautiful. Uh, and I, I, can I just talk about leadership in one little story? You sure can. <laughs> and it's pertinent because the anniversary, what's the day? The 19th was 13 days ago, 76th anniversary. Uh, 6, 6th of June was the uh, 76th anniversary of the D-Day landing, which began the significant reversal of World War II. You know, I, I wish you could, I wish you had some kind of an x-ray machine. Uh, my hair is starting to stand up on end. My eyes are already starting to tear up. The night before D-Day, the commander of the British forces, uh, Bernard Montgomery, Field Marshal Montgomery, gave what has been called one of the greatest speeches that has ever been given to a big group of his, uh, of his leadership team. General Dwight David Eisenhower, I think it's mainly because he was a Midwesterner. General Dwight David Eisenhower, dressed typically, a uniform with no medals on it whatsoever, went to the beach, wandered along the beach, put his arms around private first classes and occasionally a major or a captain, uh, and just wished them the best of luck. You know, they found some, they found some notes you know, diary stuff. And one of the diary entries was Eisenhower was so attached to his, to his soldiers that parents were willing to send their boys to die for him. You never have to read another leadership book after that. I mean, it, honest, I have said that in speeches a hundred times. I'm saying it to you. I've done it on other podcasts. I don't know how much you can pull the camera in. I can get close. I, I'm somewhere between teared up a little bit and almost. I got a, I got a Kleenex right here for you. <laughs> yeah, I really, I really, well, let me tell you one other one, which is the equivalent of that. Uh, I think it was Vicksburg, but after the Union victory at Vicksburg, uh, thousands of Confederate soldiers were lined up, uh, you know, along a road or something like that. And they found a diary of one of the Confederate soldiers. And it said, General Grant and his senior leadership team, colonels and so on, rode along the line. Without exception, other than Grant, none of those colonels even bothered to look in the eyes of the soldiers who were their fellow citizens, by the way, who had just been defeated. General Grant, at the beginning of the line, took his hat off as a mark of respect and rode three miles, he was a damn good horseman, rode three miles with his hat off 
to show respect to those Confederate soldiers. And, you know, that's the Eisenhower story times twice. And, and uh, I think restaurant owners, car dealers, CEOs of big companies, uh, you know, it didn't mean the other side won the battle or what, whatever, but I mean, that's the way to, look, I'm an old, I'm an old fart. Uh, my definition of my measure of life is, can I walk past a, meet, a mirror without barfing? But somebody said it better. Uh, David Brooks, the New York Times columnist, conservative yeah. columnist, for those of us who are, those of you or who are listening who are conservatives, wrote a column, and it was beautiful to almost the tear-jerking level. He said, there are two kinds of virtues, resume virtues and eulogy virtues. Resume virtues are, I went to the University of Texas at Austin. I had a 3.95 average. I was promoted five times in the first nine years after I got out of school. I have a net worth now of X, 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 and, X, and I'm a successful guy. The eulogy virtues are what do they say about you at your funeral? And what they say about you at your funeral, back to some of the things you were saying, is he really supported his community. He was, you know, a lovely person to people who met him. And, you know, there's a, there's a part of me that says, and, and let me make clear with this, uh, I was raised as a Presbyterian, but I'm a lowercase r religious person. Sorry to say I don't darken the doors of churches as much as I should. So. I'm not giving you a Christian fundamentalist speech when I say that, but you know the the eulogy virtues versus resume virtues, I think, is something that we ought to have put on as a tattoo uh, and carry it around with us. So we have just a few minutes left, and one of the things that you talk about so much is management by walking around, and I I try to follow that. I used to follow that at the World Affairs Council. Um, I still do in a in a different way, but how 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 should people handle this situation when you're really communicating with your your team as well as your customers? Uh, virtually? Yeah, um, MBWA in a way managing by wandering around was really the spark for in search of excellence hmm. because we discovered there were two ways of managing and leading, and two ways that could be and that success could come from stuff like MBWA. Uh, and I've always said that MBWA, to me, is a metaphor, not a technical description. Uh, MBWA is about being in touch. You know, I wrote something a while back about what, about excellence and so on. And I said, if you're the leader of a 14 person group and you do not know the names of all 14 people's children and what grade they are in in school, then you're not on my good guy list. It's about caring. And I believe, and we're, we're going to learn to do it differently, and we are learning to do it differently. I think that caring can be transmitted as clearly by the way the boss behaves in a WFH session as it can be almost as good as a, as a uh, F2F session. Uh, it's not saying we got a lot to cover on the agenda today, got eight of them, you know, we got to get through these. And I know you don't want to be there all day. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, here, here's my WFH example. And I don't know who either of the people were, so I'm not talking about uh, fake, fake news or anything else. Two television commentators both male, which is really important in a way because of the attributes we associate with men and women. Uh, one of them, you know, sitting at home, sitting in a chair, broadcasting about international problems or what have you. And his five or six year old kid comes running into the room. He doesn't abuse the kid, God only knows, but he pushes the kid out of the way. Newscaster two, his three-year-old toodles into the room with a little bowl of turds in his hand. And the newscaster turns around and says, that is a marvelous job. Now, I'm going to call your mom, and you and she can sort it out. 
you know, Newscaster 2, I mean, let's talk about the pragmatics. Newscaster 2 improved his image by an order of magnitude, uh, but he was human about it. And Newscaster 1, you know, getting paid $750,000 a year, and he's got to get through the Russian problems and the Afghani problems and so on, pushes the kid out of the way. As far as I'm concerned, he effed up his reputation for life. Yep. But, you know, that's WFH. It's, you know, WFH when the kid runs into the room uh, or what have you, or when you see on your phone that's lying next to you that your 91-year-old uh, mother uh, is calling and saying she's got problems. Well, stop the meeting, take care of, of mom or grandmom, and more important, absolutely demand that the people who are listening to you on your team, if something personal comes up, for God's sakes, get the hell out of there and let take them handle care it. Of it, or you and will have be on my bad list forever. And have a sense of humor. Well, Tom, this hour has gone by way too quickly. I really want to thank you for spending uh, time with us, and um, you stay you stay well. And I, I hope you'll write that next book too, because I think there's so much that you'll be able to glean from how companies and CEOs and others are are uh, wandering through this situation. So, well, you know, I've said to people, uh, I really would like to have the royalties, but I've written 18 books, and every one of them says exactly the same thing. <laughs> no, they don't. I've read a few. Listen up. Take care of people. Yeah, let me thank uh, again uh, Greenberg Trowick, the law firm, for their support. Stay safe, stay well. Tom, I hope to see you next time in, in Dallas. I hope so as well. And thank you for your time and attention. And thanks for great questions. And it was a, a fabulous hour. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye bye.